Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome to another podcast episode on the New Books Network. I'm your host, Ron Winslow. I'm a former longtime medical and science reporter and editor at the Wall Street Journal, and now a freelance journalist with a focus on medical and other science topics. My guest today is Dr. Jeremy Nobel, a primary care physician, public health practitioner, and a poet. He has faculty appointments at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School, and he is founder and president of the Foundation for Art and Healing, a nonprofit that has launched an initiative called Project Unlonely, which is addressing what many consider an epidemic of loneliness in our society. Dr. Nobel is with us to talk about his new book, not unexpectedly called Project Unlonely, Healing Our Crisis of Disconnection. It is a sobering, if not alarming, account of the extent and causes of loneliness in our country and its toll on individual and public health and what can be done about it. Jeremy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Ron. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So let's start uh, by, why don't you give us a little information about just what is Project Unlonely and how it got started and led to this book. <laughs> so Project Unlonely is exactly what it says. It's a project. It's uh, it's the signature initiative of the Foundation for Art and Healing, which is a nonprofit organization that I started uh, actually right after 9-11, so about 20 years ago. And that mission of that foundation is to explore and promote creative expression as a path to health and well-being for individuals and communities. As we began to do that work, it emerged that the creative arts, together with some other uh, mindfulness activities, were very helpful, not just in trauma, but what we found is people said that because of this programming, they felt more connected and less lonely. And as we started trying to make sense of that finding, together with the growing um, you know, kind of rates of loneliness in the country and the fact that it wasn't clear what to do about it. All of that came together to have us decide to create Project on Lonely as an initiative of the foundation. And that's how we got started about 10 years ago. So I should say we, we first met, uh, I guess, about 14 years ago when I was at the journal and I I did a piece uh, <clears throat> about what was then a project called Arts and the Heart, um, which was you know, premised on the idea that creativity and ex- creative expression could help heal uh, people suffering from heart disease or or other illnesses. And um, thanks to you, I got to reread that story. Uh, and I noticed that the word lonely wasn't in my story anywhere. So I gather, as you just sort of described, that loneliness, the idea of how to address loneliness kind of evolved as your uh, project uh, went forward. Well, that's exactly right. But, you know, they're very related. So if you go back to that event that we did on arts and the heart, we really were working under the hypothesis that what the arts would do and mindfulness together with the arts would do would, would reduce stress. And we know that stress actually increases risk for heart disease, increases blood pressure, a lot of that uh, related to the release of cortisol and other kind of hormones that that ramp up physiologic activity. What we weren't clear about was that loneliness also ramps up some of those same hormones and adds additional factors, including increasing inflammation and reducing immune response. And it's ironic that uh, 12 years after we had that uh, wonderful conference, the American Heart Association came out with a position statement just a year ago that loneliness increases risk for heart attack and stroke and death from either by 30%. And so we were on to something at the time. It just took us a little while to figure out that in addition to stress, loneliness is a major factor for heart disease also. Yes, very interesting. Uh, I mean, I think your um, your book makes a strong case that uh, that loneliness is a risk factor for, you know, for a lot of um, chronic diseases. Um, what, what in your work, what, what do you find that loneliness or people who are lonely, what does it do to the body? How is, what's the biology of this here in terms of how 
<clears throat> this has an effect on our health. So it's it's a really important question. Uh, how how does loneliness or social isolation? They're not the same, but they they are related. How does that impact our f- physiology and um, ultimately uh, also our behavior? And I think that's at the heart of what makes loneliness such a timely. Um, aspect of human experience to explore. So let's start with what we do know. So first of all, it's important to just point out that loneliness is not the same thing as being alone. So loneliness is the sense we have. It's in a mood. It's an emotion. It's not an objective state. It's a subjective assessment that we make about the gap between the social connection we would like to have, we aspire to, and the actual experience we have of social connection. That's as compared with social isolation, which is objective. That actually can be measured very clearly by just looking at the number of social contacts and um, that somebody has. And so they're very different, although they're related. If you, if you don't have social contacts with other human beings, often you fall short in having the types of emotional connections you would like to have with them. But it's also important to know that just being isolated and and not in contact with other people could be a very positive state. We even have a high class word for it. We sometimes call it solitude. So, <laughs> right. So being yeah. alone actually can invite us to explore thoughts and feelings, often difficult ones, and come to grips with um, some important uh, aspects of our personhood that could reduce stress and in the same way reduce uh, risk for illness. So, but let's go back to what happens in the the lonely brain. So we do know that loneliness does increase um, uh, stress, fight or flight. And maybe this shouldn't be such a surprise. It has an evolutionary background. So imagine it's 20,000 years ago and you hear a rustle in the bushes and you think it's a saber toothed tiger. I want to pick up a stick to defend myself, wouldn't you like to have 10 people around you also picking up sticks? Of course you would. And so it's not hard to imagine that in many ways our brains are hardwired to send us a little bit of a signal that we're not surrounded by the social connections that could help us survive because the world is filled with threats, not just saber-toothed tigers. And so this signal um, I think is loneliness. And just like other biologic signals, like thirst, <laughs> it has a purpose, which is to guide us towards some activities, right? And thirst, it's to seek hydration that could actually enable survival. So I think that's one very important framing that um, people might want to have about loneliness, which is it actually is a biological signal and not a sign that there's something wrong with them, that they're lacking, they're inadequate, they're flawed in some way, which is what our culture has led us to think about loneliness. Now, I'm drawing on that because that guilt, shame, that sense that we're not adequate also adds additional uh, health risk factors to the to the original stress of not having people around that you can trust on and and rely upon. So yes, there's the stress factor related to loneliness, but then there's the additional added uh, distress of low self-esteem, low self-worth, which could lead to a spiral that then increases both the stress level, but also changes additional health-related behaviors. Because if you feel you're not worthwhile, why should you care about medication adherence and and doing the healthy things that, you know, we imagine uh, allow us and our bodies to be as healthy as possible? So it's not just the brain impact. Our social conditioning around loneliness also invites a further deterioration around social health about health behaviors that we know uh, are important for chronic illness. So while you describe describe loneliness as having a subjective component, a significant subjective component, there's obviously uh, some objective uh, ways to describe it and define it. Well, that's true. And we do know that just social isolation alone, having no one around, um, you know, also increases risk of early mortality separately from from loneliness. And, um, you know, possibly that's because um, 
people are removed from other people who could pay attention to them, know that they, for instance, need attention. Um, major example, which I share in my book, the heat wave in Chicago in 1994, in which many older isolated adults um, perished in their homes. Now, what was interesting about this, this uh, event, and it was studied by the sociologist Eric Kleinenberg, who wrote his own book on that topic, is that while there was a lot of loneliness or isolation rather in older adults, the ones who also had social connections within their communities did better. Because even though they were isolated, maybe up on the fourth floor of an apartment with the windows closed and no fan, people knew that they were up there and went up to see if they were okay. This is a social isolation issue, right? And so they weren't their friends. They just knew that there were isolated people and um, needed some care. And so um, we need to be careful about both isolation and loneliness. Um, they have interactive synergistic factors and they both represent health problems. So let's step back just a little bit. I mean, loneliness became part of our national uh, vocabulary thanks to COVID and um, all the, the isolation and quarantines associated with that. But you argue in your book, uh, and as you just mentioned, uh, the Chicago anecdote from uh, the 90s, that that uh, loneliness has been uh, a significant social issue uh, long preceding our experience with COVID. Could you give us sort of a sort of what is the landscape here? How how big a deal is this? And, um, uh, you know, how would you describe that? Well, you know, I think it's a very big deal, both loneliness and social isolation, but particularly loneliness because it's underappreciated, it's stigmatized, and it's and until very recently did not get the same attention that social isolation received. So you mentioned the pandemic, and there's no question the pandemic actually has increased visibility on loneliness. And in a very interesting way, at least for now, it may have... Um, somehow temporarily suspended the guilt and shame some people feel around loneliness. Here's why. Because traditionally, as I mentioned, in our culture, people feel that loneliness is their fault, that other people don't or, or don't and will not respond to their overture, overtures for friendship because of some inadequacy or lack they have. And there's a wide variety of reasons people might feel that way. But during COVID, if you remember those, you know, grim days, particularly after, you know, kind of the March crisis was declared, March 2020 crisis was declared, we were told we had to stay in place and quarantine in order to protect public safety. So, yes, while we were lonely because we didn't have the social connections we wanted, we were doing it because we were facing a common enemy, viral transmission death, possible death of millions. And so we could share that as our, our combined collaborative reason for being lonely in a way that didn't attach to the guilt and shame of think it was be, thinking it was because of a personal flaw. So this allowed many people to start talking about loneliness. Our whole society is talking about it now. Um, our Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, you know, put a, uh, an HHS advisory out on it in early May of of this year. So this is a fantastic opportunity to really start talking about loneliness, understand it as a signal and also its consequences physiologically and behaviorally while we're in this window where it's still okay to talk about it. Well, in that light, um, you in your book uh, define three different types of loneliness. Uh, could you describe those? And, and I mean, how and how they they're differentiated from each other, if you will. And and uh, would we be able individually to diagnose ourselves in terms of which one we might fall in if we're in any of them? Yes, I think you can better understand the types of loneliness you might have or someone you care about might may have. And um, and it really comes back to why are there different types of loneliness? Because loneliness is a complex um, emotion. It's a mood state. Let's take another one that we our culture loves to talk about, which is love itself. So the Greeks had eight different kinds of love they identified, right? Love of country, family love, love of a neighbor, 
you know, romantic love. So um, I found it useful as I started to uh, do research on loneliness to come up with three types. And I, and I present them in the book. The first one is psychological loneliness. The second is societal loneliness. And the third is existential or spiritual loneliness. I'll give a quick um, overview of each. So psycholo psychological loneliness is what most people think of when they think of loneliness. Where's someone I can tell my troubles to? Where's a, co a companion? Is there is there someone who I, I can really trust and, um, you know, have a friendship with um, and rely upon? So, you know, and that is really where a lot of people's attention is focused. You know, um, where's my confidant? Right. And that is an important part of loneliness. Social or societal loneliness is different. It actually is when we feel that we are being excluded or judged because of some particular characteristic. So imagine you're, there's a room full of people and you have to enter that room and you think, is my arrival anticipated, welcome and safe? And there are people who, because of, um, you know, uh, race or um, gender identity or disability or any one of a number of factors feel that they're excluded because of these characteristics that have nothing to do with, you know, their inside true nature as a person and so on. It's a kind of um, societal judgment on, on who they are. So this is very different than not having someone to tell your troubles to. And it's actually a form of trauma to actually feel uh, systematically rejected. And so uh, trauma, a chapter I include in my book, is very associated with loneliness. And no surprise, people who feel societally uh, excluded um, do experience this significant kind of loneliness. Taken to scale, of course, you know, this is racism or this is anti-Semitism or anti-anything. So, um, so that's the second type of loneliness. The third, which probably has been around for a long time also, is where do I fit into the, the, the universe, the bigger story of humanity? Does my life have meaning and purpose? Does my life have consequence? What was here before I arrived? What will be here after I depart? And so, you know, this kind of disorientation um, was first noted by the... Um, the French sociologist, they didn't call him sociologist in the 1890s, Emile Durkheim, who uh, wrote a book in 1896 called Suicide, which really was trying to make sense of the increased rates of suicide in the industrializing uh, Europe, where people were moving from the towns and small villages into the factory cities where no one was starving to death. They got enough money for food, but they were away from um, relatives and extended networks of family. They were they were away from the stories and narratives that define culture and into a new and very uh, confusing, rapidly changing cult culture in which they felt um, a, a word in French, Durkheim used, anomi, without boundary, without without walls and metrics. And I think this kind of um, liquidity of the modern experience, uh, you know, what some are calling liquid modernity, actually makes a lot of people uncomfortable right now, not, not just in late 19th century uh, Europe. And I, I think that's the third kind of loneliness, uh, existential or spiritual loneliness. Are we really um, connected to the bigger story, the world of experience? Uh, very interesting. So you also, uh, break down, uh, loneliness, I guess, into different territories. Um, and maybe you could give us a little, uh, dis you know, summary of that, that, uh, I mean, each, each of you have chapters in the book of, for each one of these territories and, uh, boy, are they full of interesting detail. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So, um, so loneliness are social domains in which trauma is often experienced. And I'll tell you why they're, why it's so important first with a little bit of an example of, of kind of, I think, how loneliness can change from a very common signal, you know, occasional loneliness, this twinge that we need social connection, which actually, like thirst, can be helpful. It guides you towards what you need, what, what you require. But um, 
if not attended to this signal, this little loneliness that you have, the occasional, you know, where, where's a friend kind of feeling, um, can actually spiral. And because loneliness is uncomfortable. And so if it gets a little more extreme, then you might say, well, I guess I'm lonely because there's something wrong with me. And you might tend to withdraw a little bit more and so on. And then, of course, people don't quite know how to make sense of this new um, personality, like you're more withdrawn. And so they back away and then you get lonelier. So this is what I call the loneliness spiral. Now, why is that important? These five territories are territories in which there is a very increased risk for loneliness spiraling. So that's a way to think about them. Here's what they are. The first territory is trauma, where um, the experience of trauma, sustained pain or injury often makes people very tentative about social engagement, particularly if that's if their pain came from some social um, experience. Now, we think about domestic you know, violence. That's certainly a, a painful social experience. But so is war. Uh, military trauma. So is um, meteorologic trauma when your home is destroyed because of a hurricane and you're you're left adrift. Although there are elements of existential loneliness to that too. There's the day to day trauma uh, that all of us experience from time to time. So that's one major territory. The others are, I think, a little more straightforward and easy to understand. The next one is illness. Illness uh, separates us from, as Susan Suntog, the great essayist, said, the, the, the world of the healthy people is different than the world of the sick people, <laughs> and that we often feel quite lonely when we go into the world of illness. So I explore how particular types of uh, illness can um, make us lonely. So not just serious catastrophic illnesses like cancer, MS, ALS and so on, but also serious chronic illness, um, diabetes, uh, hypertension, mental illnesses, uh, but also rare illnesses where there may be no one else around that also has, say, hemophilia or some other illness characterized by having fewer than 200,000 people having that disease. That's how the Center for Disease Control um, kind of uh, identifies rare illness. So that's territory number two, illness. Territory number three, where you can experience the loneliness spiral, is aging. So aging is complex, multifactored, but certainly often associated with progressive loss of opportunities or capabilities to connect with others. A simple example is hearing acuity. If you, if you actually can't hear people communicate, you become progressively... Um, uh, less willing to talk and communicate, you feel excluded in social settings, and so on. Uh, but then, of course, there's also loss of loved ones, people you may have spent your life with, and that sense of, you know, connection and community starts weakening. And then, of course, you also have loss of other um, capabilities in addition to saying hearing acuity, cognitive capabilities, vision, um, strength, muscular strength in order to ambulate. So uh, aging has a whole set of risks for loneliness spiral. Um, the fourth uh, territory, um, a very timely one, is the territory of difference. It relates to societal loneliness as a whole category. Um, you know, uh, it's marked by systematic um, judgment and rejection of us based on external characteristics. Um, you know, uh, as I mentioned, several of them earlier, race, sexual identity, and so on, um, but also strong discord in political orientation and so on. So that's, you know, that's another uh, opportunity for serious spiraling. And the last, the territory we all share is modernity, where we all live right now where there's increasing uncertainty about our identities, increasing uh, divisiveness, um, reluctance to fully share and connect with others because of the discomfort of that, those connections, if there's serious disagreements on a variety of things. Then, of course, starting about 12 years ago, the addition of social media and the, um, while 
while digital technologies could potentially connect us the way it's often used by people, there's an unintended disconnection as they struggle um, to be appreciated for who they truly are and instead use social media to create an external uh, persona, digital avatar, if you will, in which, uh, you know, they imbue that avatar with uh, other kinds of features and characteristics, hoping to be positively uh, responded to and liked, <laughs> both figuratively and um, and literally. So I, I, it occurs to me, uh, as you're talking about this, that uh, <clears throat> that loneliness is kind of like uh, inflammation in our bodies, where initially, you know, if we have a wound or some sort of a an injury that needs to be repaired, our inflammatory response is there to heal us. But at some point, if it doesn't get, if that doesn't get cured or, you know, addressed uh, effectively, inflammatory response becomes chronic, and that's when it becomes uh, harmful. And it, uh, it, it seems that there's a, a certain similarity uh, to that phenomenon uh, in loneliness as well. Absolutely. And, you know, it's not, uh, it's not, rare in biology to find examples of this. I mean, stress itself has long been recognized that small levels of stress, um, there's even a word for it called eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S, where stress basically prompts us to pay attention, be more aware, to recognize what is causing stress and, and also in some cases to uh, improve performance. And maybe loneliness has that similar you know, there's kind of a zone in which small amounts of loneliness can prompt us to have social connections, to um, overcome whatever reluctance we might have, uh, to take the risk of connecting, because there always is a risk of connecting to others, the risk of being, of failing at that connection, of dealing with the discomfort of abandonment or non-connection. So um, I think at small doses, loneliness actually might be um, a bit of a silver lining, you know, uh, to the experience of, of living. But as I point out, as we've talked about, and as I point out in my book, as it spirals out of control, very different story. Increased risk for physical and mental, mental um, uh, health challenges and significant erosion in just um, quality and joy in life, thriving and flourishing. I just, before we get to uh, what Project Unlonely is uh, trying to accomplish, I just have a couple more or uh, one more question. Uh, um, but I'm wondering to what extent you feel loneliness is playing a role in our national divide, our political divide, the lack of civility in our conversations. Um, certainly, the you know our uh, our epidemic of gun violence. Um, how, to what extent do you feel loneliness is playing a role in that? I think there's a significant role for loneliness and I do, you know, talk about it in the book in, in social and civil, uh, just call it discord, uh, lack of civility, as you point out, here's why. One of the things we do know about how loneliness changes behavior. This is the work of John Cacioppo and some others, and, you know, the early, uh, early 2000s is that loneliness changes social cognition. It changes how we make sense of the world. And because of that change, we start seeing ambiguous signals as threats. So, for instance, there's someone walking down, um, say it's evening time, they're walking down the street towards you, you're in, a, you're in a city you're not familiar with, in a part of town you're not familiar with. Your brain is constantly alert and it's asking questions to, to assure survival. And so it's asking, is this person an opportunity or a threat? Now, we're unconscious about that questioning, but, you know, maybe we're not surprised <laughs> that that's what our brains are doing, because sometimes it actually almost feels that way. But as as we get lonelier, um, we start biasing our social cognition to start seeing uh, what I call ambiguous uh, symbols, right? Somebody walking towards you. You don't know whether they're a threat or an opportunity. It's an ambiguous signal. But a lonely brain starts... Uh, increasing the likelihood that they will perceive that situation as a threatening situation and act accordingly, right? So maybe a gesture or a hostile act or something that could be interpreted that way by the other person who then sees that 
and starts acting in a similarly responsive responsive way. And so I think that kind of dual choreography, where as we get lonelier, our brains uh, then also make us very wary, um, but then uh, also uh, increase impulsivity and um, and lack of rational behavior. You combine these um, behavioral orientations to human interactions, and it's not hard to imagine that what you see is uh, some erosion of civility, some erosion of the initial assumption that someone is well-meaning into first uncertainty and then um, even worse, you know, a prejudging of a situation that other people might be harmful to you. Uh, We'll talk more about that because I think that general spiraling uh, is something that we try to address in some of our programming in uh, a project on Lonely. Well, let's uh, let's go in that direction. It seems to me I, I I'm I found it interesting that in reading the book I sort of uh, encountered my own relationship, if you will, with loneliness and trying to f- figure out how uh, you know how you know what it meant to me and when I was lonely and how I addressed it if I did. Um, so you have two ways. I mean, there's two themes, I guess. One is sort of addressing an individual's way to. Uh, address and re- respond to loneliness himself or herself um, or and then then the broader public health uh, strategy for addressing it so uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, the creative creativity circles and uh, these sort of individual ways that you ask people to uh, access their creative impulses absolutely and and by the way so that um approach, the invitation to allow curiosity and uh, imagination and making to bridge the gap between ourselves and others uh, can be used both at an individual level and an organizational, institutional, and community level. So it's the basic model, and then we could talk about how it might be applied in both settings. So first, it all comes down in many ways to what's going on Uh, in our brains when we start to imagine and create. And so um, there's some very, very important um, advances in neurophysiology around creative expression. It's now, the field has a a new name, relatively new, called neuroaesthetics. It's now an area of great study. Um, um, a book just came out recently, Your Art on Brain, by a friend and colleague, Susan Magsamon, and her co- co-author, Ivy Ross, that unpacks how much we've learned in just the last 10 years around how arts impact the brain. I'll, I'll give a, a, a quick view how I put it together. So the first is just the direct influence on brain physiology. So we've known for a while, and now it's it's been more reinforced, that uh, creative making, uh, creative arts, whether the making of it or even the beholding of art, and again, all the arts, music, movement, language arts, uh, visual art, but also the culinary arts, right? The creative making of food or knitting, sewing, crocheting, quilting, the so-called textile arts, which have been around for a long time, or even gardening. All these creative making activities uh, reduce the the stress hormone cortisol, so we're more relaxed, but also they they, uh, increase the levels of the so-called feel-good hormones, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphins. So to start with, you know, your brain on art, you're more relaxed and you're in a better mood. That's pretty good for for connecting right there. (laughs) But very excitingly, in the last just a few years, some using some functional MRI scans, there's some evidence that um, that aesthetic creative activity, again, the making of it or the beholding of it, activates brain regions that overlap with the exact brain regions that determine social cognition. The one I talked about earlier, that's always asking opportunity or threat, opportunity or threat. And so it it's really uh, forms the physiologic basis for what many have experienced. 
that when they have um, a powerful creative experience, either beholding or making, they feel a little more generous towards the world. <laughs> they may feel less stressed out or they, they feel, um, and, and, and this has been tested, they, they feel and act more collaboratively, more kindly to others. Often they feel or describe this as a state of awe that has some very positive effects, reduces blood pressure, does things and so forth. So the brain on art is definitely, you know, uh, can move in some very positive uh, connecting, loneliness reducing direction. So that's one area where I think the arts are critical. And again, we use these creative mechanisms in our programming. The second so, one. Oh, go ahead. Go more questions I wanted, on that? Yeah. I just, one other question, which I, th I think we talked about this 14 years ago, Jeremy. But to be in a situation where somebody says, sort of, you know, tells someone to be creative, to sort of get connected to your creative impulses and uh, interests, you know, you make a point in the book that where many of us are disconnected from those uh, those impulses from, you know, from childhood and so forth. So it's almost intimidating to be asked to be creative, to uh, exercise this. Uh, how do you get around that in your, uh, in your, um, in your work and your um, ideas to address this? Yeah. So that's a terrific question. Many people do feel intimidated by the arts and they say, gee, you know, I, I, I wish I could do that. And then if I, you know, so sometimes people with cancer say, well, I've heard the arts can help, but I'm not an artist. So, you know, I'm not going to go down that road. So this is the second way the arts can be helpful uh, with loneliness is they actually invite us to tell our story, which is something most human beings with a little bit of prompting actually are willing to do. And storytelling itself is a creative act, right? You're, you know, you're thinking about character and plot and timing, right? And so, and it also turns out that when we tell our stories, dopamine levels in the brain goes up. So it, it actually feels good to share our stories. So why does this help with loneliness? When you, um, when you go through the process of making and sharing your story, you become, you know, kind of in a way um, more, clear about what your own, you know, kind of personal story is because you're trying to share it. And in your doing that, you reveal many unique aspects of yourself. I actually found that experience in the writing of the book. I decided uh, I would add elements of it of my own story, often related, you know, to, to uh, things uh, where loneliness was, was was a feature of that. So, so the book's not a memoir, but I thought I would just show by simple example how storytelling uh, could be helpful. But there's more on the storytelling front, which is when you're telling your story, you're telling it to or with some other people. So it's not only you get clear about your story, but other people begin to see you and your unique elements of your story and begin to relate to that because while they may have had, and everyone has a unique story, as humans, we share certain elements in our story, Think, things we celebrate, loss, pain, uh, regret. These are human experiences we all share. And so when we see it and hear it in someone's story, we relate to it. And then we can share our stories in return. And that's actually much of what we do in our programming is we give people a chance to share stories. So, yes, it, if you say you got to come and, and do artwork and so on. And if you don't couch it in a way that's comfortable and familiar, it intimidates people. But we find that if framed as a way that people can find and shape and share their personal stories, it really um, welcomes them instead of intimidates them. So <clears throat> how do we uh, get this to scale? Uh, you mentioned, uh, I mean, you mentioned in the book, uh, the role of health plans and, <clears throat> you know, and other organizations to try to bring this in and they're already strapped. Doctors are already strapped with trying to get a whole lot into a 10 or 15 minute visit with a patient. Uh, how do we bring this to the fore in a, in a broad, broader way? Yeah. So this is a this is a, a, a typical public health challenge. Right. You know, if you have something that you think would be helpful, how do you get it out and make it available and accessible to everyone? And so I draw on that public health strategy. In fact, 
that's what we're doing with Project Unlonely. So um, I think the first important thing to recognize is there's no one entity organization that's responsible for loneliness. It's a, it's a shared responsibility across the community. And many stakeholders have a role. So government certainly has a role, but so do um, health systems, health plans, employers, faith-based groups, any community organization that has a community they care about. So these are community organizations, uh, even um, libraries, museums, you know, uh, places where people go because they naturally can connect with other people. And to recognize that that's where connection happens. That's where that's where people have these sometimes s- small interactions with other people that we think are inconsequential, but end up having a lot of consequence because they give us a sense of social coherence and fitting in and belonging to a bigger social narrative. But how do we make it happen? So I think there are three steps. I think the first step is just to begin a to just be more aware at the community organization level that this is something that's a possibility. And of course, there are always barriers and challenges. So you mentioned the um, time pressures in a primary care visit. So as a primary care practitioner and also someone who's spent a lot of their professional time trying to design um, scalable healthcare delivery systems, I'm well aware of this problem. So part of it is recognizing that you don't have to have the health system deliver unlonely programs. You just need to have them be aware that loneliness is a risk, make sure they explore whether that risk factor is present in their patients in the same way as we ask them about smoking and seat belts and stress. And then if it does, uh, if it does represent a risk to make sure that that, that patient is educated and aware, and in some cases guided to, resources in the community in which they can experience the um, opportunity to learn more about loneliness and possibly even develop the skills and the motivation uh, and even have the experiences of being more connected. So this is called social prescribing. Uh, It's been around in the UK for 10 years. There have been several experiments in the US already. We did one uh, a few years ago on diabetes. you know, it turns out that people are responsive to this. So that's that's how we get it to scale, Ron. It's to recognize we all have, each organization has a shared responsibility. And some in particular will find their own mission better achieved if they can include these connecting activities uh, in the communities they serve. Well, Jeremy, I have one other question, but before I get to it, uh, I mean, I have many others, but one other I want to ask for sure. But uh, before I get to it, is there anything uh, <clears throat> that you, you know, kind of wanted to say that we haven't covered yet? Well, I, I think we, we've co- touched on it um, in, in a couple of areas, but I think, you know, for the people listening, I mean, just it's the reframing of loneliness from, I know you hear about it, Surgeon General takes a position, you know, we have to, you know, cure loneliness. I think it's important we understand that loneliness, the, you know, the occasional and mild twinges of the need to connect is actually one of the most human of feelings. I don't think we we should be thinking about eliminating it. (laughs) I think we need to understand it and see it for what it is. And be very, very vigilant about the spiraling effect. So to understand that we do need human connection and to not feel embarrassed or ashamed to seek it or to be or to when we see an opportunity to offer for each of us to offer it to other people, uh, simple, kind communication, engagement, reassurances. This is how we can invite people to feel more connected and block the loneliness um, spiral. So. I think that is the big opportunity. And then, of course, reinforcing infrastructure at the community level, the institutional level, um, you know, the government level. These will all be very helpful accelerants uh, as we begin to recognize loneliness uh, for what it for what it is and make sure that we can block its most toxic effects when it becomes uh, um, spiraling into significant levels. Well, a tall but important order, I think. So uh, an important part of your your bio is that you're a poet, and I wonder how that 
you know, that part of your life has uh, influenced um, this whole idea uh, of bringing arts to uh, healing some of our social ills. Yeah. So thank you for, for asking that. You know, so I, I started doing poetry when I was in high school um, and I had some events. I don't know. Spoiler alerts. You'll have to read the book to hear them. But I had some disconnecting personal events around, around that time. And I found poetry very powerful as a way to better understand my own situation and in, a, in an interesting way to communicate it to, to a reader, even if it was just in my own imagination. And, you know, a friend of mine calls poetry the social act of a solitary person. Because when you write poetry, just like making most art, you, you're imagining someone you're writing for or, or, or hoping to experience your art. So I, I've always found it, um, you know, a very positive uh, experience. And it has guided uh, my interest in loneliness when I see how powerfully not just poetry, but the art, other arts forms can be so helpful to so many people. Um, you know, and again, as this is obviously we want to take this to scale compared with a lot of other things we do for healthcare at a very, very low cost. <laughs> for sure. Well, I want to wrap up with uh, asking you to comment on one, <clears throat> one thing. There were a number of uh, lines that I would have to say jumped out at me in, in reading the book. And this one was kind of early in, in it, uh, but in keeping in, <clears throat> in, uh, with keeping engaged with this notion of, of art, uh, and this, its healing powers, you say, remaining engaged in creative expression may very well be an essential survival skill of this century. Wow. Where does that come from? How do we, how do we make that happen? Well, I'll, I'll tell you why I think it's more, I think the arts probably have been helpful at any point in the, the human experience, right? You talk about cave painting. Why'd they make time to put all those marks on the wall? It must've been doing something for their survival. I think it's more important now because of what I mentioned before, the disorientation, the rapid changes in our current society uh, across the world, the need to use our imagination to see ways we can connect with others and to be less afraid. And I think, you know, just anything we can do to ramp down <laughs> the fear levels and ramp up the curiosity levels is going to increase the odds that the world can move forward in a way that uh, we can all be enthusiastic about inhabiting it. Well, thank you very much. The book is Project Unlonely, Healing Our Crisis of Disconnection. Jeremy Nobel, pleasure talking to you. Thanks very much for the conversation. My pleasure too, Ron, and it's nice to keep this conversation going. Let's check in in another 10 years and see how we're doing. Sounds like a plan. All right. It's a pleasure. Take care.